to this first evening of Global Scholars presentation. Um, we are excited you are here. Um, we really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to attend and support these seniors. Um, a few words about Global Scholars. Uh, for those of you that are new right now and unaware of the program, um, it was founded in 1996 by Dr. Joe Duffy, um, who was in charge of the program for many, many years. Um, this is Carol Rogers assisted him in that effort. And it was created as an opportunity for our self-directed, talented and curious students um, to create some time in their curriculum uh, to pursue um, a passion and an independent study. So um, this independent study takes place over two years. And over those two years, they complete no fewer than five AP courses. Most of them take many more. Um, they complete a good deal of community service. Um, they attend a class that engages various philosophical theories and ways of examining knowledge. And they embark on a large scale paper. And I think the one that you're going to um, hear from today is around 80 pages long. Um, and it's that project that um, we're here to celebrate and listen to and witness tonight. And in some respects, it's the end of that journey. Um, before we uh, begin, um, I'd like to uh, thank the faculty and administration at Park Tudor School for continuing to support this program um, because it is one that promotes intellectual excellence. And I'd like to thank all the adults, the parents especially, our panelists especially for agreeing to come tonight, mentors that have nurtured and gathered guided our students. And finally, um, there's a number of seniors in the room that are global scholars, and I want to thank you personally for your patience with me as I adjust into this new role, um, somewhat successfully, but with a lot of hiccups along the way, and for your honesty and letting me know how I could uh, continue to support you and for all your hard work and dedication. It's been so gratifying to be part of your growth. <coughs> If you are a student of Part Tudor and you do not have um, an extra credit history social studies card and you would like one, you can fill out two of these and get credit in your history social studies class. And so um, just raise your hand at the end and I'll come and meet you on. But without further ado, I'm going to ask Milan to come down and introduce Aruna. <coughs> Be honest here. Um, I don't really know where to start when it comes to this guy. Uh, I've known and been close friends with Aruna for almost four years now, uh, and I can safely say he is one of the most confusing people I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> uh, and no, that's not an exaggeration. Uh, his almost robotic memory, his seemingly unfortunate power of remembering the dates of even the most obscure events, and his well unique sense of humor and style are all the reasons why I don't think I'll ever be able to truly understand what's going on here. But he uses this unique mind of his to do amazing things. He's taken 13 AP classes and exams. He's been commended for national merit, and he's qualified for the AIME, which, if you don't know, is basically a test for people who are really, really, really good at math. But he's done some great things outside of academics as well. He's been a varsity soccer player. <laughs> A dedicated Boy Scout and now Eagle Scout after completing a project he slaved over for hours. He's been a very involved member of his temple, putting in hundreds of hours of volunteer work. And he's even been a member of the Park Theater Jazz Band for four years. Which you should totally check out, by the way. I've heard they have an amazing concert player. <laughs> uh, I could continue to list off more of his accomplishments, but I don't want to belabor the point. Everyone in this room knows that Arunav is an extremely qualified and impressive individual. And I'm sure that whatever or wherever he ends up going for college, he's going to do amazing things. But above all these academic and extracurricular accomplishments I've mentioned today, the one thing I put at the top of his resume is how he's been an extremely loyal, understanding, and compassionate, and overall amazing friend. When it comes to sports, we usually disagree, as I'm from DC and he's from the Big Apple. But I'm sure this presentation will be amazing. So without further ado, I present to you Arun Absinthe.
thank you for all very much for the tremendous support you guys have uh, given to me just by showing up. And so uh, for this presentation, which probably has the longest title you've seen, uh, <laughs> from the sidelines, the exploratorian examination of the societal and personal benefits weighed against the bodily and neurological impacts of high-intensity sports, aka benefits of sports versus concussions. Uh, so before I start, I'd like to acknowledge a few people, um, and many more beyond that. First, uh, thank you to Milan for that uh, excellent introduction. You probably overqualified me in that. Um, also, thank you to Tommy and his family for putting together this great evening. Congratulations on finally becoming a global scholar too, Tommy. Um, I'd like to thank my family for raising me. Uh, <laughs> with Hindu and Indian values, my dad. Uh, Dr. Anand Sinha and mom, Dolly, uh, Dr. Dolly Rani, and then my sister as well for being a sister. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also like to thank our Global Scholars Coordinator, Ms. Saidi, for the excellent work she put in her first year to help uh, maneuver this program in mostly the same direction, but with her own added twists. Some of the philosophy she taught is uh, the basis of my presentation today in the utilitarian aspect. Uh, furthermore, I'd like to address my panel, and so that's going to start off with Alexander Miyamoto, who's a senior here at Park Tutor. She's a great peer, um, great experience with soccer. Um, then we've got Mr. Spencer Sunrumil, who's an upper school math teacher here at Park Tutor, and next year he's taking the reins of the upper school uh, head football coach here at Park Tutor. Then we've got Mr. Joe Famusa, who's a college counselor here at Park Tutor, as well as a social studies teacher, and he's taught me government. And we've got some very good discussions in here. Uh, next, we've got Mr. Jared Smith. He's a MD PhD candidate, and he's currently doing his PhD in neuroscience at Stark Neuroscience Research Institute, and that's where I was over the summer. So he was a great help to me in uh, those two months. Uh, then we've got Dr. John Parsons, who is at the NCAA. Uh, he's a managing director at the Sports Science Institute, and uh, the work they're doing with the neurology field is uh, pretty is going to be pretty monumental in the NCAA. NCAA. And then finally, we've got Dr. Gary Sales, who um, is an associate professor at IU Bloomington for the Department of uh, Kinesiology. Um, so thank you all to my panelists for coming here to evaluate my present, uh, presentation. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge my mentor as well. He was unable to make it as he lives in Nashville, but his name is Dr. Aaron Yingo Khan. He's a uh, third year resident at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, he's doing neurosurgery, and his specialty is sports-related concussion, so over the past seven to 10 years, he's been really looking deep into this field. And then over the past two months, we've been emailing consistently uh, he's been sending me papers and giving me advice on what direction to take my paper, and so I'm very thankful for his efforts there. Um, so now we're going to get into the body of this paper, and so here's just a quick overview. Um, I'm going to start by introducing a couple of concepts, and then we're going to look at the first part, which is uh, the benefits to the person and to the society of playing sports, and then we're going to, after that, look at the risk of injury and concussions through playing sports. Um, and then after that, we're going to look at implications, so utilitarianism, rule of weight, etc. And then just my personal outcomes from doing this gargantuan project. So the research question reads similar to the um, title, and that's going to be uh, Through the Eyes of Utilitarianism, should people participate in high intensity sports, such as American football, when considering the positive impacts on personal development and society? as well as the, founding, the findings surrounding bodily injury and neurological impacts. And perhaps unconventionally, I'm going to answer this question uh, very simply right now, and then I'm going to present the research over the course of the next 40 minutes to defend my point. So my answer to this question is going to be yes, it is okay to promote high-intensity sports from a younger age, as the risk of injury does not outweigh the benefits of playing, and additionally, there are preventative measures. Let's take a huge step back. Um, and introduce a couple of things. So first, uh, let's take a look at the definition of sport. So there's two definitions uh, from major dictionaries. The first is going to be through Oxford Dictionary, and they tell us that sport is an activity involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against another 
or others for entertainment. And for me, the key here is going to be the physical exertion and the word compete. There's this element of competition that is inherent in sports, perhaps team versus team or player versus player, and then there's always some sort of physical activity involved. Um, the next definition is going to be a rather outdated one from Merriam-Webster, and that's just, quote, a source of diversion. And the term diversion was a term used in the 1800s to really talk about some sort of way to um, get past the normal workday and just have a fun time. And so just by this definition, you've got games such as pinball, which is just a source of entertainment that's out of your workday. So a game of pinball would be considered a sport. And then if you go back to the definition of Oxford Dictionary, the game of pinball does not have any physical exertion. And really, you're not competing against any one person uh, unless you consider the high score leaderboard. But uh, in, in the nature of the game, it's pretty individual. So this distinction in the definitions of sports really gets at the nature of competition and uh, the physical exertion. And so I created a definition personally for high intensity sports uh, that's it's going to be sports which involve a lot of physical contact with other players, fast-paced movement, and stress from the pressure of a necessity to win. So, obviously, as bullet in there, you see the physical contact and the fast-paced movement and stress. Those are going to be three key elements to a high-intensity sport. So, for example, football and basketball have, uh, for the most part, all three of those uh, elements, whereas baseball, uh, has some elements of those three, but is less of a high intensity sport than, say, football or basketball. Um, next, let's take a look at the role of Hollywood with, when it comes to sports. So, um, I've listed there six movies that uh, have played a significant role in the media's portrayal of sports. And Hollywood is known to shape the opinions of a lot of people who just uh, want to watch a movie and they pick up lessons from it. And so, movies such as uh, Rudy, uh, Friday Night Lights, and Rocky are uh, movies which show the positives to playing sports. So for example, Rudy shows the story of a boy who's in love with Notre Dame football, um, and he's inspired to work uh, hard and make the team, uh, despite all the obstacles he personally faces. Rocky, uh, Friday Night Lights is a s similar uh, tale of going through the football motions, and then uh, Rocky is a tale uh, of a story of a poor guy named Rocky Balboa who finds his version of the American dream as a working class member through uh, the sport of boxing. But then you've also got uh, films such as Concussion, Million Dollar Baby, and Cinderella Man that show um, the injury or the concussion side of playing sports. So the movie Concussion, 2015, uh, featured Will Smith and uh, detailed the work of Dr. Bennett Amalu in the discovery of CTE. So it put the NFL in a very weak spot because uh, it showed the real dangers of playing sports um, through this disease called uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, the film Billion Dollar Baby is similar in that it portrays the story of a boxer who found herself unable to fight um, after sustaining an injury and eventually she lost her purpose and committed suicide. Uh, but Cinderella Man is a different tale. It's also a boxer, but it shows the recovery of the boxer, and the boxer finds a way. He's, uh, his right hand is broken, and the boxer starts to learn how to fight with his left hand. So it shows the determination that people get from sports. Um, it shows that they'll always pursue success, and that's a good value. Um, and so the next thing that we can look at is media and role in sports. So first, this graph tells us uh, the amount of TV coverage from 2002 to 2017, and you can see how much it's increases. Uh, it started in 31,000 hours across the whole year in 2002, and it's uh, increased linearly up until 134,000 hours of sports programming on TV every year. Um, so that shows really a significantly high demand on TV, uh, especially on channels such as ABC, CBS, Fox, and NBC. They all have regular sports programming such as 
NFL on Sunday or NBA on Sundays. Um, and the other part of media is going to be social media. And that's when we look at Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, uh, those have made significant strides to incorporate sports. And according to Navigate Research, sports fans are actually 67% more likely to use Twitter to enhance their viewing experience compared to non-sports fans. So Twitter is really a conduit towards uh, improving the sports experience. Um, and additionally, uh, the opinions and uh, clips that are featured on these social media, they go viral a lot and they further popularize the sports. Uh, so now let's move on to the personal benefits of playing these sports. And we're going to look at the physical, mental, and social benefits. So first of all, we've got the physical development and uh, maintenance. And so this one seems pretty obvious, so I won't go too into detail. But um, in 2010, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, uh, reported a positive correlation between the students who participated in high levels of physical activity and improved academic achievement, decreased risk of heart rate and diabetes, improved weight control, and less psychological dysfunction. Um, additionally, playing sports is going to make up for that cycle of inactivity and unhealthy lifestyle by improving the way that people use calorie expenditure. Uh, they increase the time spent away from entertainment media, video games, and they minimize unnecessary snacking. Um, the next one, the next benefit is going to be decision making. And so a 2000 study actually reported that they investigated the relationship between participation in sports and health related behaviors in the US youth. And so they found that both male and female athletes were more likely to eat fruits and vegetables, um, less likely to engage in smoking or other illicit drug taking. And Though the dr binge drinking remained rather consistent, uh, males were less likely to sniff blue or carry a weapon of dangerous activities. Um, additionally, not all risky behaviors uh, performed by adolescents were really curbed by the participation of sports, it's not 100% causation. However, the majority of teenagers who participated in sports, they appear to be less interested in taking health risks than non athletes, and that's under the ideology of protecting your body in order to compete well. Um, the, another personal benefit is going to be on the mental health front. And so in a study done in Canada, there was 850 students from 10 Canadian schools who were surveyed about their participation in school sports, such as basketball, soccer, track and field wrestling, gymnastics, etc. And the study found that playing school sports during the adolescent years is significantly linked to lower depression uh, symptoms, lower perceived stress, uh, better self-rated mental health in the young adulthood, and much more. So, in other words, these young adults from age 12 to 17, uh, they're, they, they have stronger mental health about four years later when they do a follow-up test. Um, according, uh, so according to one of the co-authors of the study, Catherine uh, Savastrom, she says, Team sports offer a high emphasis on group goals, social support, and a sense of connection that provide opportunity for learning adaptive co coping strategies that can be essential for long-term mental health. Um, so that was one of the main findings of this research. Um, and additionally, we can look at the impact on women who play club sports. They actually enjoy better mental health and life satisfaction. Uh, in a study, they found then people so, so, sorry, so women who participate in team sports actually find more satisfaction uh, than with their exercise than people who participate in like walking alone, so single activities. And so the idea of team versus individual, people are finding better mental health effects while participating in team sports. Um, perhaps because of the <coughs> bond created by the team, the trust created within the team, etc. Um, then we can look at the chemical impacts on the brain. So, in this diagram we have the major neurotransmitters, nor norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, and the positive, uh, the results that they have in terms of uh, emotions and mood. And so, uh, the idea here is that sports and physical activity bring about various changes in the brain, which are otherwise only achieved through, like, drugs. 
Uh, similar to sport and physical activity, drugs for treatment uh, of depressions act on the brain's capacity to absorb serotonin. Um, all, but also support the drugs can strengthen the epinephrine activity and ensure the release of various uh, factors for nerve growth. And these factors um, promote cell growth in the brain and promote the death of cells in the hippocampus, uh, which is otherwise caused uh, causes depression. So sports and physical activity has a similar effect as those drugs, just in a much more positive way. Uh, finally, we're going to take a look at the social skills and the attributes that players develop through playing sports, especially at a young age, like youth sports. So first, uh, as I touched on earlier, girls who participate in sports are less likely to be depressed, more likely to reach their higher academic goals, and more likely to uh, demonstrate improved self-confidence and body image. Um, in the CDC in 2005, they reported, or they showed that frequent vigorous activity reduces the risk of feeling hopelessness, or suicidal tendencies in both male and female. So in addition to the physical benefits of exercise, the social support and acceptance that being part of a team can provide uh, contributes to the success of the sport in reducing the risk of suicide. Uh, it also helps on three facets, which are communication, belonging to a group, and standing up for self and others. And so finally, I'm just going to conclude this section by showing a quote from a high school football player in Texas. And in Texas, the football culture is very popular. And so this is what Blake Watson of the Flower Mound Marcus has to say. He said, high school football teaches lessons that the rest of high school fails to teach you. It teaches the importance of determination, perseverance, camaraderie, how to overcome adversity, and sacrifice, which are lessons that can't be taught or tested with a pen and paper. And I thought that quote was particularly striking because those are values that are pretty important for personal development and uh, happiness in life. Um, so now let's look at the benefits of sport to society. And we're going to look first at the American dream and the concept of the huddle in sports. And then we're going to take a look at three case studies of athletes who acted as a catalyst for change in society. So first, here's the definition of the American dream according to the founder of the concept, uh, James Trunzel Adams, in his book, The Epic of America. He says, uh, the American dream is a dream of social order in which each man and each woman shall be able to attain the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and recognized by others for what they are. So the real key here is that it's not factored in socioeconomic status. It only factors in your innate abilities and your values such as wanting to work hard, perseverance, etc. So now let's take a look at an example of the American dream. Uh, we'll take a look at Michael O'Hare, who is featured in the film The Blind Side. Um, and just a quick backstory on him. So his mother was an alcoholic and crack cocaine addict. And his father, Michael Williams, was frequently in prison. So he received very little attention and discipline in his early childhood. And uh, he really failed school a lot. He had to repeat first and second grades, and he attended 11 schools during his first ten, uh, nine years as a student. Uh, so he was placed in foster care at the age of seven after his dad went to prison, and he alternated uh, living in various foster homes and periods of homelessness. But soon, when he was in high school, he uh, was adopted by a family. Uh, they helped him to succeed academically. They hired a tutor for 20 hours a week. Uh, and he rose to the of his football and basketball teams with his hard work and dedication and his passion for the sport. So then after attending Ole Miss, he was a first round draft pick by the Baltimore Ravens in the 2009 NFL Draft. And so that's a, quite a remarkable turnaround that really embraces the ideology of the American dream. Um, throughout the course of his NFL career, he uh, earned contracts totaling $50 million which is a startling number when you compare that to the poverty that he was raised within. Um, another aspect of, of sports, particularly football, that we can look at is the huddle. And so here we have Sean Adams who talks about the huddle, but um, so I'll let him talk about the huddle. Yes, cool. Where we learn the virtue of the huddle. Where you take north and south, east and west, conservative and liberal, black and white, you put them in the same huddle. You give them the same color jersey, you give them a common goal, you let them sweat, tear up, and work hard together. And special things start to take place. All right, 
right? So I thought that quote uh, by Sean Adams was particularly striking. It really highlighted the idea that nobody cares about your background when you're in the huddle with the team, with the common goal, um, with the pursuit to win, or, or whatever that might be. And this is really something that you see best with the huddle in football, and I don't really see it well in other areas of society as much as, as, it, as, much as I see it in football. Um, and so now we're going to move on to uh, the idea that sports is a catalyst for change in society. And we have three case examples, and the first is going to be Jackie Robinson, who in this 40 second clip, uh, he, he's going to detail the shift in perspective on black people in America through his experience of playing baseball um, and being integrated into the Major League Baseball. Well, their lives had heard that there was a great deal of difference between blacks and whites. And when they started to associate with us and they found out that all of the things people said that we use the same locker rooms, the same showers, the same facilities, so something's going to happen. They lost that fear after a short time and they became, I guess, as aggressive in terms of the success as anybody. Of course, I feel a little bit too about it because all that time was happening, nothing was happening to me either, you know. So while they had their fear of things that happened to me, to them, I, I felt good because nothing was happening to me as well. So it made it kind of an evil kind of a situation. But the whole situation that came breaking the barrier was done simply because we had a purpose in mind to go out and win. And, uh, right, so he talked about that common goal again of wanting to win, and he used that common goal as a way to integrate black black people into the MLB, and not only uh, did he have stellar play while he was in the MLB, but this is accentuated by the fact that he never fought back the taunts, the very racist taunts that he uh, experienced in Philadelphia and a lot of American cities. Um, Barack Obama actually said that there's a direct line between me, uh, between Jackie Robinson and my presidency, and uh, John Lewis. Uh, famous U.S. Senator, the one is right now, is uh, he said that, or he, he really spoke on Robinson's impact and that uh, he, he thought that Robinson really opened up the conversation for and allowed for black people to feel more comfortable in social settings such as a, a baseball game. Uh, now looking at a more modern example of uh, the social change for uh, for African Americans, and we'll take a look at Colin Kaepernick, who was famous for kneeling uh, during the national anthem. And this really sparked a significant conversation surrounding the race relations in the United States, which was already active through having a black president and uh, prominent movies such as Black Lives Matter. But Kaepernick led a lead wide movement and centered, centered around the kneeling during the national anthem. And here's his quote on that He says, quote, I am not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies on the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder. Now this quote is particularly striking because uh, it opens up the conversation for these uh, black people getting killed on the streets. and. Effectively, what it did was it made the NFL focus a lot of their efforts, about $80 million worth, onto social justice efforts. Uh, one NFL owner actually realized that the players, quote, do have the ability to affect the na national dialogue. Um, so the major impact of Kaepernick's action was that both sides of the political aisle started a much needed conversation surrounding the race relations in the United States. And finally, we have uh, Pete Manning who is a hometown hero here in Indianapolis, and he is probably one of the greatest role models in society for so many reasons. First of all, he was an MVP four times in the NFL, so he was a spectacular quarterback, um, especially in Indianapolis. He led Indianapolis to a Super Bowl, uh, two Super Bowls and one of loss, and that brought a lot of popularity to the city. But his, the reason he is such an exemplar, such a great role model, is what he did uh, with his brain and what he did off the field. So Peyton Manning was known for a less physical style of play as a quarterback. He was one of the slowest players in the league. And while he had a strong arm, the key to his success was using his brain. Manning was probably the smartest player to play in the game of football um, through his techniques of um, audibling before 
play before the snap, um, and really strong planning. So this acts as an inspiration to those who are physically not as strong as maybe the other players on the football field. It shows that you can play with your mind, uh, and you can still win through mind tricks and just being very smart. The other thing he's done is off the field work. So first of all, he has the Payback Foundation, which has distributed $4.3 million to noble causes like youth groups. And he's donated millions of dollars to medicine, uh, so, such as the St. Vincent's Children's uh, Hospital, which was named for him, Peyton Manning's Children's Hospital. Um, he uses valuable connections as well um, to raise awareness for causes that not only he believes in, but he understands that everyone should believe in. Uh, so his stellar on the field and off the field record, uh, they, they show that through hard work and determination that you can really have smart people that make significant changes in this society to live the best life. Um, so really these three case studies, Jackie Robinson, Colin Kaepernick, and Peyton Manning show the magnitude of sports uh, following, the magnitude of sports following has a significant impact on the societal change uh, that we see. And the argument that I've made here is that sports acts as a catalyst for the societal change, um, and not necessarily the other way around. Uh, we also saw that for in the fourth way with Magic Johnson, when he had HIV, um, he led the conversation on how safe it is to interact with, in the public with HIV when he played in the NBA with HIV. Um, so we looked at these three founding players, but I'd like to focus on this guy, which is a transition. His name is Austin Colley. So Austin Colley was a wide receiver uh, for the Indianapolis Colts from 2009 to 2012. Uh, in his first season, he was the second leading receiver for the Colts for a uh, great target for Peyton Manning uh, in that Super Bowl season. And, but take a look at his personal life. He, uh, he was born in Canada before moving to the United States to Sacramento. Um, he, he's here uh, with his wife. He, he married BY, at BYU while he was there playing in college. Um, he also faced a little bit of difficulty with his football growth when he went um, on his church mandated mission, because uh, he's Mormon, but nevertheless, he cites his faith as a Mormon as a key tenet of his successes. Um, so his playing career, he had a stellar career at BYU, and then he was drafted by the Colts, and he prospered under the leadership of uh, Manning, who, as we discussed earlier, was a great quarterback. Um, after his retirement, he focused his efforts on consulting with a group called Canary Speech, and Canary Speech is a speech and language company that specializes in the area of identifying disease and human condition through speech. So they use a variety of machine learning technologies to solve problems at, which are at the intersection of healthcare and technology. They actually have an app that records your voice, and from that they can seemingly accurately detect depression, stress, anxiety, tiredness, concussion, and many other things. And so why did he go into this uh, company? That's because he sustained two concussions uh, in back-to-back -back years. So this is a clip of the first concussion he sustained uh, against the Philadelphia Eagles. And you're going to see that he's knocked unconscious, which is very scary. You can see he lies motionless. And you're going to see again in the second replay. It's not even that terrible of a hit, it's just uh, when you're going through the motions of football, you can end up unconscious, just like calling it up there. Um, uh, so we're going to take a look at another example of concussion. This is in a college football game. Job at best, uh, he was a player on uh, Cal Berkeley, and you'll see him also lying motionless. That's very disturbing. It's, he lies motionless there, unable to do anything, and later the commentators realize the magnitude of such an injury. He did go on to the NFL. Um, he was relatively successful, but I mean that's a really tragic injury. There. Um, here's an example of concussion in soccer. So it's not just in football, uh, and you can see that this play is actually a common play in soccer. It's just a header, um, but two players collided and it caused an injury. Uh, a concussion. 
So you see the initial reaction, uh, and you're going to see the collision here, right there. And that's a play that's very inherent in the nature of playing soccer. Uh, so not only is there a risk of concussion present in football, it's also present in sports like uh, soccer. Um, and then, so we're also going to look, uh, and so now we're going to take a look at the risk of injury. And injuries can be present in all sports, especially football, soccer, and basketball, etc. So this is Chris Borland, and Chris Borland retired after one year in the NFL. And this is why. Quote, I just honestly want to do what's best for my health. From what I've researched and what I've experienced, I don't think it's worth the risk. Now his announcement cont contributed to an awakening of the masses. It drew responses from players who supported and opposed Bar Bar Borland's decision. Uh, it drew responses from public health specialists who applauded his, his courage. Um, and it drew a response from the NFL, who had to defend their image. In particular, the NFL, which was already under uh, fire because of the recent sports reports surrounding CT and all, um, the dangers of playing sports, they came under fire and they had to point out that, quote, football has never been safer and we continue to make progress with rule changers, uh, safer tackling techniques at all levels of football, and better equipment, protocols, and medical care for players. So his retirement was actually one of uh, many in the last 20 years that cite head injury and uncertainty of long-term effects as the reason. So let's, tip, let's take a look at the rate of injury in youth sports, uh, so age 5 through 19. So uh, first you can see that the number of injuries uh, in football is a significant percentage of the amount of total participants in football in the year 2009. And similarly you can see in the sport of soccer it's a very similar percentage. So, uh, and going from the outer look, we know that approximately 30 million kids uh, aged up until 19 across the United States participate in sports. And of these kids, the National Safe Kids Campaign estimates that 3.5 million suffer any sort of injury, which causes some sort of decrease in performance. Um, also, of kids under age 14, 775,000 go to the hospital emergency room with sports-related injuries every year. And that's really the population that we need to look at, which is the youth. Um, so first, let's look at the types of injuries that are most common in sports. That's going to be, first, a hamstring strain. Then you got a muscle strain, muscle pulls. Uh, we've also got rotator cuffs. Those are more commonly seen in baseball and golf. Uh, we have knee injuries, and we have concussions. So here's an example of a knee injury that we see in uh, Victor Oladipo. And this uh, should show you the inherent nature of danger of knee injuries in the game of basketball. Take a look here. It's the right leg. He plants it, and you can see it just gives right there. And he goes out, you can see he's trying to protect himself, but he knew right away, and what you'll see next, he grabs the right area, right leg. Yeah, you can see he's clearly distraught in pain with that uh, fall. And it was not even like a, someone pushed him over, that was uh, self-inflicted. So that shows, just by running the game, it's possible that such an injury is possible. So let's look quickly at knee injuries before moving on to concussions. So knee injuries, uh, Happen, so the most devastating injuries that happen are often knee ligament injuries, which are, are when one or more of the four ligaments uh, is strained, pulled, or even both. So these can be injured by a swift change in direction that the knee uh, was not prepared to take. And so the four ligaments are the ACL, the anterior cru uh, cruciate ligament, the posterior cruciate ligament, the PCL, uh, in the center, as well as the medial collateral ligament in the inside of the knee and the uh, lateral collateral ligament in the outside of the knee. So the ACL and the PCL, they're the ones that regulate the movement of the shin bone, while the MCL and the LCL provide stability for the knee. So these are very important ligaments. Uh, they're put up, but additionally, they're put under high stress in playing sports, and when they're torn, they can result in a very long recovery process. And so now that we know about knee injuries and other injuries, let's take a, take a look at the one that's made the most new, which is concussions. And so this is a, the definition of the sports-related concussion through uh, in the Berlin Conference for uh, Sports Concussion, and you don't have to read that. But the three important takeaways are that number one, concussions are attained uh, while playing with a direct blow to any of the areas which a connection to the brain. 
uh, which is important because these occur across all sports at a relatively high frequency. Uh, number two is going to be that uh, SRC, sports related concussion, has a clear short term impact and may have medium term impacts in some cases. Loss of consciousness is a symptom. Um, so this reinforces what the media has currently portrayed, which is that concussions have some clear short term impacts um, up to a loss of consciousness. And third is going to be that SRC cannot be detected through imaging. This is key because it's rather determined through analyzing bodily and mental function. So when evaluating SRC, there are no clear image results which can affirmatively tell someone about the extent, the extent of a brain injury. Instead, the impacts of concussions are evaluated mostly subjectively through a test of neurological functions. And as it stands, a major goal surrounding SRC research is finding an objective test that can diagnose a concussion, including neuropsychological testing, balance met metrics, eye movement assessments, etc. And that's also going to lead to another issue that will come later, which is underreporting. Okay, first, let's look at the physics regarding uh, the physics in chemistry regarding the brain being a concussion. So, first of all, when the brain is uh, when the skull is dealt a blow, the brain experiences uh, both rotational, which is circular, and translational, which is back and forth forces. Um, with rotational forces giving more damage to the axons, so the brain bounces around in the skull and may lose functionality uh, because the chemical receptors are blocked. And we'll explain the chemistry later. But the rotation combined with the accelerating forces results in a torque that results in a loss of consciousness. So while the brain is in a swirling movement, it will make contact with the two opposite sides of the skull. Um, sorry. It will make contact with the two opposite sides of the skull, which are called the coup and the contra coup ends. Uh, and so the chemistry during a concussion is also very interesting. So, first of all, uh, neurons work through a change in the membrane, uh, the membrane potential, which is maintained by the difference of electrolytes uh, inside the cell compared to the outside. So these neurotransmitters are, uh, there's neurotransmitters also in, in neurons that bind to the receptors on neurons, uh, and these receptors sit within the neuronal membrane and are either themselves or an ion channel or they are coupled chemically or physically to an ion channel. So, what happens is, since these receptors and ion channels are not rigid, they, they're flexible, they can be damaged during the process of a concussion. And when you have head trauma to these uh, neuronal membranes, especially along the axon, uh, you're going to get damage. And in the process of damage, you have recovery and repair. And through this repair, you have a high, significant need for energy. So one consequence of that is that uh, so the correction of this memory potential is going to require a significant increase in cell energy use to drive these ion pumps uh, to go back to the normal memory potential. And the result of this is going to be a lot of fatigue and fogginess. So uh, the significant increase in uh, energy needed is going to make the rest of your body tired. So let's look at, look at a couple of symptoms of Concussions. So, as the graph shows, the most common symptom is headache, and that's going to be at an almost 95% uh, rate. And this may seem like a good indicator of concussion because of the high symptomology rate, but the fact is the headache can be much less or much more than the impact of a concussion. Um, similarly, other symptoms such as dizziness, difficulty in concentrating, and sensitivity to light can be attributed to other uh, things that can go on in your brain. Uh, or any other um, possible damages, not including a concussion. So basically, from the perspective of a player, uh, it's very hard to tell whether these symptoms are actually the uh, result of a concussion. And since these are so commonplace, um, they can be a result of just physical exertion. And that's, there's so much confusion, confusion around finding the symptoms surrounding concussions. Um, now let's take a look back at football, and from these graphs, which you can see, first of all, the graphs show the head impacts sustained per practice and per game. So first you can see that uh, through the inherent nature of playing uh, actual game sports, uh, especially football, you're going to sustain a lot more head impacts uh, because that's when you're actually putting in all the uh, effort and you're playing the most intense game. But furthermore, the main takeaway from this graph is going to be the, how much 
head impacts the offensive and defensive linemen sustain. So they have the highest uh, to amount of high head impacts per game, and that's going to be because of the inherent nature of the game that you're going to see in this next clip of Quinton Nelson, who is an offensive lineman for the Indianapolis Colts. So that's just a little play. It's hand-to-hand -hand combat on almost every play. Um, very intense. Uh, you can see it again here. Um, and this, this is very repetitive hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. Very you can see the intensity there of the game. And then you see this. Uh, yeah. Uh, pancake, yeah. You see that pancake uh, showing the very intense nature of playing on the offensive and defensive line. So now let's look at the issue of underreporting of concussion. And there's there's going to be three reasons why uh, underreporting is such a problem. And first is going to be the pressure from teammates, coaches, parents, and fans. Uh, second is going to be the personal motivation to continue playing. And the third is going to be the injury history and severity. So first, uh, the pressure from teammates, coaches, parents, and fans was studied uh, by Alicia Crocious in Oregon, and she has all the research on underreporting. So there is a little bit of uh, bias in that most of the research was done by one author. But uh, what we can tell from here is that um, of all the athletes, most of them experience a very low amount of pressure from uh, the four groups, teammates, coaches, uh, fans, parents. So that's about 54%. However, those who experience high pressure, which is around 33% of players, uh, those players uh, are going to have a lower intention to report symptoms of a future suspected concussion uh, than their peers who have experienced less pressure from future, or fewer sources. Uh, so let's take a look at the other two. So first of all, the internal pressure one faces to report or not a report is very hard to quantify. But the basis of this thought goes back to the idea that there are three factors which influence the pressure of a player to report, which are environment, person, and behavior. So the findings regarding the intent to report um, tend to be consistent, that players are more likely to report uh, as they present more symptoms of the concussion. But also studies have found that uh, high school athletes are aware of their injuries and have no intention to report. Now this could be because they have a personal stake on the line. So for example, they are trying to maybe reach 10 goals in soccer and they want to score that 10th goal before leaving. So that's a personal goal that they see. Another one could be they want to help the team win and they, they're the best player and they have to be there to help the team win. So you have motivation factors such as that. But you also have motivation factors such as you will be seen potentially as less popular if you have to not if you have to be taken off the field and you can't just uh, participate with your teammates. So pressure can also be internalized through indirect pathways. For example, um, you can lose uh, competitive opportunities through uh, and social. You are often socially isolated from the team when you sustain a concussion and you're out for a period of time. So according to a study, previously injured athletes who notice these effects the first time they had a concussion, they were actually less likely to intend to report a future concussion, which may, uh, which is attributable, attributable to that learning process that it wasn't so nice the first time when they reported it. So with that issue of uh, underreporting, we can now look at the long-term impacts. And first of all, we're going to take a look at the perception of CTE, chronic traumatic traumatic encephalopathy, and then we're going to take a look at the lack of research surrounding these long-term impacts. So first of all, CTE. So CTE was popularized first in 2005 when uh, Dr. Bennett Oxford <coughs> had a case study of a patient, a dead patient, and he discovered incidents of CTE in that uh, NFL player. Uh, and that skyrocketed, um, especially around 2015, when this research got even more prominent and was featured in the movie Concussion, uh, featuring Will Smith. And so, uh, the idea here is that the media often pushes this narrative that football players suffer concussions in great magnitude, and then as a result, they have punishing long-term health effects. Um, this narrative is actually so popular that the common person has been led to believe that every player in the NFL will have CTE in the long term. 
Now there's going to be three major problems surrounding this perception of CTE as we know it. The first is that in contrast to general impressions, the incidence of CTE is actually unknown. The clinical diagnostic criteria have not been agreed upon in the current uh, neuropathological processes of CTE are, are very primitive. Uh, additionally, point number two is that there are very few studies that have compared the pathologies <coughs> of CTE with those of other neurodegenerative disorders or of age match control, so perhaps like depression, or comparing these patients uh, to normal members of society. Consequently, there's a significant disagreement that continues about the neuropathological aspects that make CTE unique. Uh, the third thing is going to be that CTE is widely considered to be a consequence of exposure of, uh, to repeated head bugs. But the evidence actually suggests that a single, moderate, or severe traumatic brain injury can also induce the progressive neuropathological changes. So the idea of subconcussive blows or consistent warfare amongst the player is not actually a result, uh, does not actually result in CTE. So these three problems surrounding CTE make the issue very unclear and lead to the confusion among the public and healthcare professionals. Um, the other thing is going to be the lack of long-term impacts uh, and the, the lack of understanding for these long-term impacts. So first of all, numerous articles have actually established a link between concussions and other long-term effects such as Alzheimer's disease, suicidality, or depression. But the fact of the matter is, um, when you look at these studies, these studies often have either a biased pool of players which they selected, or they don't really compare it to an age control uh, group. So these conclusions are often very hard to uh, corroborate in a follow-up study. So, in fact, the research has actually yet been able to link concussions to depressive or dementia-like symptoms in a well-done study. Um, the current studies that, uh, that do suggest a correlation between the head injury and long-term health effects, their bias with the selection of players, um, the selection of the brains is a particular uh, issue with that, and, and, but in large studies actually, comparing the depression and suicide rates between ex-NFL players and age mass controls, the depression and suicide rates are very similar. Another major factor in all the discussions surrounding the long-term effects is the idea of correlation versus causation. So, whether the depression is, a root, is directly related to the concussion, or if they are just attributable to other factors. For example, um, when these players retire, they've experienced such a VIP status while they played, and then they may slip into depression because they're no longer experiencing that VIP status and just falling off the cliff, uh, not known to anyone anymore. Um, they have, so effectively, they have a complete change in lifestyle. That's attributable to also diets and other things. Uh, and basically, due to an overall lack of empirical data, uh, the narrative that the media has set out to be, which is that the long-term impacts of playing sports and the concussion result are devastating, that's very hard to corroborate using a well-done study. So now let's take a look at some technology that's around uh, to, number one, detect the concussions, number two, understand the concussions, and number three, prevent the concussions. So first, to detect the concussions, we have video review. So. Uh, video review has been along for a very long time across different sports, uh, but now it's being brought into the medical world where it's being used to detect when a player has a concussion. So they'll use uh, signs such as loss of consciousness or responsiveness, uh, lying motionless, uh, motor coordination, impact seizure, or uh, no protective action, no shielding on behalf of the player as potential uh, indicators that the player has a concussion, so they have to follow a protocol which takes the player off the field and then evaluates the player for a further concussion. So that's one way in which technology is being used to detect these concussions, especially during the play. Another a technology that exists and uh, is very recently discovered was the near infrared spectroscopy, which quote, um, so to image the brain, the researchers place a cap similar to a swim or a bathing cap on the top of the head. The cap contains small lights that have sensors connected to a computer. When researchers turn on the lights, they can uh, monitor and measure brain activity. So this device is non-invasive and portable. 
And so this is actually a step forward in the use of biomarkers to detect concussions, as the researchers are analyzing the blood oxygen level and other levels in the brain to see if any of these levels correlate with the concussion in the brain. So these confidence are confident in the ability to track subjects um, to learn more about concussions. So this is the University of Calgary's uh, project, and Stanford is also in efforts to produce technology which detects concussions, as are a bunch of other uh, universities. And the third is going to be uh, preventative technology, such as helmets. And so now technology is being used in high caliber helmets to prevent concussions from happening in the first place. So you have this one called uh, Vicus, which is started by a, a Seattle-based startup, and they received a massive government contract to create a safe helmet, a helmet for the NFL and other football games. And so this is a helmet that quote, has a has an outer load shell that is deformable, as, an, uh, as well as an inner layer of columnar structures designed to absorb the force. <coughs> So the uh, effect of this is that you're going to get a much safer helmet, and therefore you can stop these concussions from happening in the first place. And so with these technolog the technological innovations, uh, we can move on to the implications of this research that we have here. So um, as you saw in my title at the very beginning, uh, I'm going to take a utilitarian examination, uh, weighing the pros and cons, and then I'm going to take a look at the age um, the role of age, and I'm going to give a recommendation based on that, and then I'm going to touch on some questions remaining uh, that extend following this research. So the idea of utilitarianism was, uh, according to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, um, a theory that the aim of action should be the largest possible balance of pleasure over pain, or the greatest, greatest happiness for the greatest number. So this was actually developed by English philosophers Jerry, Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, and they discuss how utilitarianism is determining that quote an action is right if it tends to promote happiness, and wrong if it tends to produce the reverse of happiness. And so general utility is this idea of measuring the ha the happiness that these players uh, that people experience through the course of an action. Utility is also seen in economics when measuring uh, the benefit or harm of purchasing something. Um, and so the concept of general utility is Bentham's way of calculating whether an action was morally just. And then, so what they did do is you calculate the, cal the units of pleasure that you receive from doing an action, and uh, you calculate how many units of pain come from the action, and then uh, you compare those two quantities. And so I chose to use the lens of utilitarianism because it applies well to my project in that you can evaluate both the personal benefits and harms of playing sports as well as the societal benefits and harms of playing sports. And so you can uh, compare the pros and cons of both. And that's really important because um, that leads to the idea of personal decision making. You, you weigh the benefits and you weigh the harms. Um, through the eyes of utilitarianism, and then you make a decision on playing sports. Uh, next, we're going to take a look at the uh, role of age. And so, we have four numbers here, 18, 21, 25, and 12, and I'll explain all four of those. So 18 is the age at which boys and girls are considered legal in the United States. And that is, they can enlist in the military, they can purchase cigarettes, and they can vote. But the legal uh, age to drink alcohol is 21. And the typical current reasoning for, uh, given for that is that 21 is the age which the brain uh, is, develops, especially the prefrontal cortex, which is used for making decisions. However, the original intent of the use of the age 21 was that when they did studies, they found that boys, uh, and girls, mostly boys between the ages 16 and 21, had the highest incidence of uh, car crashes. And when they implemented the 21, the age 21 uh, drinking age, they saw a 61% decrease in the drunk driver fatalities in the age group of 16 to 21 over the course of the next 18 years. Um, but, so the third number is going to be 25. And so first of all, scientists uh, suggest that the age of maturation for the brain is between the ages of 10 to 24. And so by age 25, the brain is fully developed. Uh, one study, uh, and so 25, the theoretical 
seemingly be the age where you have the most involvement and therefore make the best decisions. But then another study finds that around the, the quote, around the age of 12 years, adolescents decrease their reliance on concrete thinking and begin to show their capacity for abstract thinking, visualization of potential outcomes, and a logical understanding of cause and effect. Now this is very interesting because the connotation is that risk perception among 12 year olds is high enough to determine whether uh, a dangerous action, such as playing high intensity sports, is worth the risk. But the real problem actually between players uh, age 12 to 18 is the role of emotion. So according to different research, uh, teens were found to be capable of reasoning of, about the possible harms or benefits of different courses of action. However, in the real world, teens uh, still engage in dangerous behaviors, despite understanding the risks involved. And this is primarily due to the emotional drivers that control decision making. So the role of emotion is very significant when considering uh, decision making amongst these younger uh, demographics. So now, this is Amos Reed, who is a CFO player, and he's going to discuss, or just rephrase basically the whole central dilemma of this whole research is based on. Why high school football? Today it is the biggest boogeyman there is out there in the whole concussion world. Don't let your young boy play football, it'll ruin his life. But why am I going to speak on that? Well, I'm not going to tell you how to fix football, that's just not going to be Talk about why. I think we'll all agree. The why is big enough? So if the why is big enough, we can always work on fixing the how. I thought that was very um, striking because in football, we've established a why in terms of personal benefits and societal benefits, and we're looking for a how. Um, so this is where I come to the conclusion of my, uh, of my research after presenting those two sides, and why, and I'm going to tell you why playing high intensity sports is worth the risk, and I'm going to give you three reasons. First of all, playing the game benefits the players in developing a solid physical structure, mental acuity, and a sociable character, um, and that was just at the beginning, and then also society moves forward uh, and finds playing and watching sports as a source of diversion and a time of need for entertainment, and it also acts as a catalyst or a conduit for change in society. And then the third is going to be the fact that the long-term impacts are not as bad as the media would suggest, especially with safe play and technology, as we discussed um, later on. And so, here are seven ways that we can reduce the risk of concussions of sports, as presented by, uh, well, sort of a blog by a PhD um, focused on health safety. And so, there are seven suggestions for better training and coaching, better enforcement of the existing rules and rule changes, reducing the repetitive head impacts in tackle football through limits on full contact practices, better equipment, neck strengthening, head impact exposure monitoring, and delaying the start of contact inclusion sports. And so, these seven recommendations are very, are, are the start to helping players find a safer way to. Um, play these sports without attaining a concussion when they play. And so with all that uh, research, we have a lot of questions that can be posed uh, in the future So for other researchers interested in similar topics. So the first is going to be, how do we make playing football safer while maintaining its value to people in society? And that could be through technology and whatever. That's, a, that's the first question I'm making. From there we have a question of, what are the true long-term impacts of playing football, particularly relating to concussions? And the third question remaining that can be looked into deeply is, in a country which embodies free will, whose role is it to regulate the participation in sports? And that's a question that uh, I'm going to leave you guys on to think about as I discuss my outcomes of this project. So, uh, I had really two big takeaways from this project. First is the role of deadlines and how I work better when I set personal deadlines of maybe just completing five pages of my paper uh, in three days, as opposed to having one deadline just three weeks in the future. And that's really important because that's going to help me in the future understand that if I want to complete a lot of 
a long and deep project such as this, I need to set smaller deadlines um, in order to complete the full project. And I found that I was pretty successful with meeting my personal deadlines, and that's why I was able to commit uh, to finish the paper in a timely manner. Um, I didn't complete this presentation in a timely manner. I completed it at 2.30 a.m. today. But, <laughs> but that's because I didn't set those deadlines for myself for the presentation. <laughs> but really the role of deadlines was um, really helpful for me to understand more of my work ethic. Um, and the second thing is what true scholarship is, and so uh, one teacher here likes to talk about what is true scholarship, is it just memorizing facts, well, he says no, he says it's really understanding uh, the background and the historical processes of everything, and uh, through doing this project, I really truly understood what true scholarship is and how I can get the best scholarship, and that's going to be through choosing a topic that you are actually very interested in. Because if you have a personal stake in learning about the topic, um, it's going to make it more fun for you to research and it's going to make you want to research. Like throughout the course of this uh, writing the paper, I didn't actually find myself not liking what I was researching. Um, well, oftentimes, maybe in a history class or whatever, I'll find myself just bored and <laughs> I'll put in a very weak effort, but here it was 100% effort, 100% of the time. Um, the paper took 90 hours to write, and of those 90 hours, a good majority was spent reading, and I really enjoyed that reading because it was on a topic that I was super interested in. And so with that, um, I want to thank you guys for your attentiveness, and I'd like to open the field for any questions. So, do you, do you hear that? 
that all concussions are the same based on everything you read? Oh, absolutely not. So, first of all, concussions can have, uh, there's, uh, so the real term of <coughs> concussion that I, uh, we use in the lab is TBI. And so there's going to be mild and moderate TBI and severe TBI. So there's three different levels of TBI, uh, traumatic brain injury. And those three levels of TBI, TBI have different implications. So actually during my summer research, uh, I studied a data collection of 100 patients. And of those, 12 had severe TBI um, in a motor vehicle accident, and six of them passed away. Whereas of the 50 patients who had mild TBI, zero of them passed away. So with the different varying levels of uh, TBI in patients, uh, you're going to have different implications. And personally, I don't know how drastic the differences are in symptomology. Of a, I mean, I showed you in that graph that loss of consciousness is at the bottom, about 3% of players experiencing that. So I think that's closer to the medium to severe TBI, whereas a headache can be just a result of mild TBI. So there's definitely different symptoms. Yeah, that's actually a very good point. Uh, when you can have the, the brain can go back and forth inside the brain despite the fact that you're wearing the helmet. But I found that through my research that the helmets actually do the best job of keeping the brain stable. Um, it's only in very rare cases where the, and I'm not 100% sure, sure, but it's, a, it's in rare cases where the brain is going to act irrespective of the helmet protection. Um, and in those cases, you're going to have the brain touching both sides of the skull, and then you're going to get your concussion just by having a helmet. And we do see that in the NFL with the helmet. So, there. Um, so as you're Um, yeah, especially hockey, because uh, I didn't really cover hockey because I don't care about hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Joe, but, um, but hockey and boxing, along with football, are seeing significant increases in participation. And I feel like soccer is, like, soccer and basketball are the sports that are going to pick up participation as a result of uh, football, hockey, and boxing <coughs> increasing the participation numbers. And that's regardless of the fact that I showed you that soccer actually has similar rates of injury uh, compared to football. Uh, even though soccer is deemed safer because you're not forced to hit it with the ball, especially women, women don't hit the ball quite as often as men do. Um, and so you have a less risk of concussion through the inherent injury of the game of soccer while maintaining similar level of physical <coughs> So yeah, I do think that there's going to be increasing levels of youth participation in other sports. Uh, uh, yeah, in the first part of your uh, presentation, you talked a lot about the benefits of sports uh, to people's uh, personal health and society, and I agree with all your points. Um, but it didn't seem that a lot of it uh, specifically pertained to high-intensity sports. Um, so what would you tell people the, the benefit of uh, specifically high intensity sports work in society, if they were telling you um, to just play the low intensity sports. That's a very good question. And so in Angus Reed's full TED talk, he discusses how in high school football, you're going to have 88 opportunities to uh, go on the field and participate in the game of football. And so football, more than other sports, is going to have a ton of opportunities for any player to get partic participate in the game. But also, the uh, nature of the game of football and high intensity sports is that you have to develop a trust within your teammates that your teammates will help you uh, when you may suffer an injury or when you need help. Um, and it is in those games such as football where you really need to develop that trust and relationship with your 
uh, teammates. And the final thing there is that uh, I talked about the huddle, and the huddle is most prominently seen in high-intensity sports uh, where you need to really play in the head, such as football. Um, Sir Felisa? Do you think, um, do you, so if you played football back in the 1980s in high school, there was no such thing as a concussion, really. Oh, okay. yeah. Right? So, um, and it's come up, you know, it's such a completely different world. In your work, in this, and by the way, you were scholarly at first. Thank you. He was a teacher. You got the distinction between a high school assignment and a college, and then you nailed it. Um, but in your, in your work, what a lot of people are going to say, old school like me, they're going to say, or they're going to wonder, well, anything's a concussion. Like, you know, if I were to slap myself upside the head right now and walk out and get a little dizzy, they'd say, oh, you have a concussion. Do you think that part of this, um, is connected to uh, those who are on the side of overdiagnosis of concussions? Is that, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to be objective about this because, again, anybody who played football back in the day is going to say that, that the world now has gone soft and these are, you know, consistent with the rules, creation of snowflakes in society and all this kind of stuff. And so, uh, Mr. Special Somerville is, is not in that world, though, because I knew him 10 years ago when he played high school football. I'm not a part of him, but um, I, I'm interested in whether or not, as a scientist, whether or not you think that concussions are diagnosed properly today, are they? Are we too sensitive to diagnose concussion? Concussion. Don't ask you about the scientific. Yeah, diagnosis. absolutely. So first of all, I, you did touch on the na uh, nature of parents and people being more overprotected in today's society as opposed to before, and that's seen through the historical trends that I mean we see in U.S. history and world history. Um, People want what's best for their children a lot more today than in the 1980s, for example. So there's that. There's also, I did touch on my paper, but not on this. There is some rates of misdiagnosis of players just on the basis of the fact that you want to be sure that the player is going to be safe uh, to return to the field to play. And the player might not actually have a concussion, but you want to. The, People are, want to be more sure today of whether they do have concussion or uh, not. So it's, it's more of a sociological answer than a scientific answer there. Um, mm -hmm. Culture and landscape. Can I interject just a minute? Okay. Absolutely. Can you go back to the slide where you have those seven recommendations? Sure. Better training for your memory for the seven. Okay. Um, nowhere. In there, does it talk about hubris, the landscape, you know, the attitude of players, and you know, and, and that whole thing? Are you hurt or are you injured? You know, and if you're hurt, get your butt back in there. If you're injured, you know, go right. sit down. This kind of thing. And then you talk a little bit about, you know, not wanting to let down my teammates and things like this. There are lots of reasons not to, you know, let individuals know that I have a concussion or that I'm feeling dizzy or got a steamer, as we called them back in the day. All right, um, but you know, one of the things I would recommend. Eight is to change the landscape, the culture of the sport, of the participants. And I'm not talking coaches down to players because this is going to be controlled by the players. But what happens behind closed doors, the conversation that we have with each other, you know, um, and, you know, their values, their beliefs about what is and what is not manhood and, and how they define their participation in the game. That's the landscape that I don't see up there. That's, that's hubris. That's, you know, the culture of the game, that's embodied by the players themselves. So I would say, you know, reprogramming these players on the reasons for playing, not, not playing safe, because today, I mean, I saw quarterbacks who were able to get out of tackles because guys didn't understand the new rules, and I don't want to concuss myself, I don't want to get a penalty, and as a result, score a touchdown, because the landscape is changing. Yeah, so so my, my, my question to you is, how important do you see this? I mean, you know, this is all important, and it's all science, and it's technology that can be measured, but what about the attitude of the Oh, so, yeah, no, I definitely think culture is a very significant part of um, why people choose not to report a concussion or choose to report a concussion. So um, the whole idea of not wanting to let down your team is very important uh, when people choose to continue to play um, with an injury, and so the first the, uh, one thing that can be addressed is teaching players that at the end of the day, your personal health is very significant too. 
So yeah, the landscape is very important as you mentioned. You said from the sidelines, I got a throw one at you, and, and, and all right, I'm 67 years old. I had knee replacement surgery four months ago. Um, I've had seven surgeries on my other knee and got issues with my lower spine. Athletic related. Absolutely. And I would go back and do it all over again. Is that sick? Is that abnormal? Is, what is your interpretation? <laughs> that happens because you understand what I'm, you guys understand what I'm saying. Yes, I would go back and do it again. Yes, I absolutely would. Because, because, oh, yes. No, not at all. Not, no, I'm talking about the joy, the fun, the camaraderie, yeah. those things that you identify. Yeah. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Uh, well, Mr. Sonnen, <coughs> Of the cost, and, and I was going to, I was going to ask you a question about your conclusions because, if I can simplify for a second, what I understood you to argue is that in, in looking at cost versus benefit, you found lots of benefit, little cost, especially given your analysis of the state to CTE research. So that calculus combined with free will led you to the conclusion. Sure. But let's imagine a hypothetical different future. Uh, and the next student is doing this analysis, and what research has found 10 years from now definitively mm -hmm. is that 3% of, of all people who ever play football will go on to develop CTE. How does your calculus change? Or does it? So then at that point, my argument is going to be that there is always going to be risk associated with activity, and so your personal decision uh, should be weighed above um, perhaps, so you, you should have the personal right to be able to play the sport, but then where I change is going to be the age at which you should be make, able to make that decision, and I'm going to say that should be around 18 or 25, um, because you need to be able to make that decision at a point where you fully understand the consequences of stuff on your body, but um, like you need to fully understand the existing research before you make a decision to play. So, while the idea that people should still be allowed to play still stands, the thing that changes is at which point in the personal development do they decide uh, to pursue the sport. To what the risk is for. Right, yeah. But the extension, the practical extension of that conclusion is that then likely the entire system of football dries up. Because if you're not going to allow somebody to make a, an autonomous decision yeah. to play until they're 18 or 25, they've missed the entry point and they might be able to so you're essentially arguing at that point that the, the viability of football is, is in question, and you may be arguing that. Yeah, so that's, uh, you're going to see a significant decrease in participation uh, amongst the population 18 to 36 if you don't allow people to make a choice to play before 18. But I guess the response to that would be you could provide a safer alternative, maybe you can still have flag football, you can have tackle football. Um, so there would still be avenues to playing the game once you turn 18 or turn 25 or whatever, but um, I do agree that participation would significantly dry up as a result of such implementation of policy. Taking away from the board. Yeah. Um, Mr. Sandoval? So, recommendation number one about this particular blog was better training and coaching. Mm -hmm. um, in your paper, <laughs> um, you talked about the coach's role in character development. Yeah. Uh, but then you mentioned also a minute ago, maybe the coach had like helped his boxer commit suicide. I see, and, and to his point uh, a minute ago, talk a lot about the environment that is around the game, football in particular. So with better training and coaching, you change the environment. How do we get better training and coaching if that's the number one recommendation by mom saying? So that's the that's the big dilemma, which is how do you first of all get old time coaches to develop more um, educate to be willing to take on that education and then also getting that education of better coaching to younger coaches, maybe in under certain areas. So um, yeah, I, I don't have any recommendations right now as to how you can instill better coaching into um, the game of football, but I would say like through the use of 
if you find a good coach, maybe like Bill Belichick or whatever, that, um, <coughs> that whose role model you can follow, um, I guess you could show a paradigm that is spread throughout maybe high schools and middle schools um, to teach those coaches a true value of coaching. And, but it's very hard, I would agree, to educate the masses, especially educate football coaches to better train their players. Max. So using the totalitarian lens that you mentioned in your thesis, I'm struggling to see why uh, encouraging people to play football, who, like Peyton Manning you mentioned, are very smart people, uh, instead of using their intelligence for something like the scientific work or political work or something that would benefit our society more directly, I'm struggling to see why that is a, a totalitarian advantage. Well, first of all, it's utilitarian. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, I do agree you can exercise your brain power in other fields. However, it's your personal destiny. Um, it's your personal choice to do what you find to be the best use of your time. And if you really have a lot of fun playing football and you want to use your smarts to play football, um, you can make a positive in fact, through that, we can also uh, get the most personal benefit from that, being able to do what you love to do, uh, and while being smarter. We're going to have to stay kind of like so we're going to two questions more. Sure. Yeah. Uh, David and Damar. Okay, so uh, I was looking at this list um, and I, I, I noticed number seven. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, U.S. Soccer released a memorandum for the entire country that said, from I think it's U12 and below, you heading or heading is gone. You can't head the ball. Games practices. If you head the ball in a game, it's a free kick to the other team. And over the last two years, there have been studies done on that same age group who's moved up into the U14, U15 bracket, and they've seen a rise in head, neck uh, injuries. And the reason the reasoning behind that is essentially they don't have the ball anymore. They don't know how to protect their decks. They don't know how to properly head the ball, how to protect themselves. In the course of your research, have you found, which one have you found, or have you found one to be more beneficial over the other? Um, delay, sorry, delay, yeah. or? That's, that's difficult. I didn't actually know that you get more, I mean, it makes sense that you're going to get more head injuries because you're not strengthening your neck muscles from a young age. Um, but I also do think that it's important to um, consider that heading is a very dangerous part of the game and up until the age of 12 you should not be allowed to do it because you're not at the uh, ability level cognitive to determine whether it is safe for you to um, take those uh, headers. But, but then afterwards you do experience a greater risk of experiencing a concussion through headers, but then to that I would say you can play the game of soccer. Your coach might get mad at you, but you can play the game of soccer without hitting the ball. Um, like I did all throughout my four years of nursing soccer. <laughs> 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 um, I, I rarely hit the ball. Um, and so you can still make that personal decision to not take the risk of hitting the ball, um, even after the age of 12. Because you do understand that there is a risk to it. Omar? Um, so first of all, a great presentation. Thanks, Omar. Um, um, you talked about um, under-reporting. And yeah. so I was wondering, are these just players who are kind of self-diagnosing themselves and then um, just not telling anyone? Or is it, and then going off of that, do you like, um, concussion testing agencies or like medical professionals, do they currently or do you think they should have like an obligation to like tell the teams that, um, of the players like um, condition and then sit them? Okay, yeah, so to the second part, there's a lot of concussion education being done by uh, concussion institutes um, and medical programs and that's seen, I mean we see it at our tutor, we see it at, uh, throughout the state of Indiana because the IHSA mandates it. Um, so there is concussion education, but I think the main problem with underreporting is what you mentioned is that uh, people are self-diagnosing the concussions, but they're not willing to report it for a host of factors. 
uh, that we discussed earlier in the presentation. And so it's because of those. Uh, so people do generally have a good indication that they have a concussion just because they feel a little different in the head um, after playing a sport. But for a host of factors, they're just unwilling to report it. Any final questions? For I think you have a panel list that has I was just going to say along with that, it's, it's really hard to detect concussions as well. Like, there's, like Peggy said, there's not many you can really detect it with like, imaging. There's not many people that you can imaging. But one thing that we do in our lab, we're trying to actually find like blood markers for it because it's hard to even detect any blood markers because you don't know what you're looking for. What are you looking for? You know? So it's just kind of like the, it's, the field is very, very dry, but on top of it, it's still kind of a newer concept. So, you know, it, like I said, there's a lot of different factors factoring into why it's so hard to tell what the question really is. Is there, I think one of my students said something about a helmet with sensors. It doesn't measure concussion, but it measures head jarring, or, or, and it's connected to a computer. And an impact force. How extensive are those types of helmets available in the industry? Are they still experimental? Very experimental. Like for example, the helmet that's in my research, that's a 980 watt helmet that's really being only used by NFL players because of the extent of a few colleges. So the helmet research is very primitive, um, but the, those advances are being made. So, uh, there are some. There are some of those services that are available for helmets that are on the market right now. I'll say that. 90% of colleges use Rydell helmets, which have a sensor attached to them. But that sensor has to be monitored by a member of the athletic training staff on site. Uh, they will pull a player if the sensor reads at a certain level, but then they still go through the same interaction on the sideline to see whether or not And the sensor measures the intensity of the impact. Right. And Rydell is how, how All right, Ms. Heidi, any concluding thoughts? Would you like to take one more question from Jake? Or is that his hand up for a while? More than that. Okay, uh, well, that's the last one. I played football for like four or five years in elementary and middle school. Mm -hmm. And granted, we were like smaller, so the hits weren't as hard, but I actually never got a concussion. Yet I still quit because of concussion. But then last year in baseball, I actually got two concussions. So do you think there needs to be like a paradigm shift away from football being a dangerous sport, or do we still need to regard football as being dangerous, but it's still worth playing? I would say the latter. Um, I would say that, I mean, according to the data, you have about half players playing football to sustain some sort of injury over the course of the year. Um, and then in my paper, I discussed the rates of concussion for the football players, um, and so, I don't think it's fair to say that football is not inherently danger, dangerous in the nature of playing it. So I think that we should keep that ideology that football is dangerous, but I think we should further enforce that um, it's, it is still an option. So I think it is fair to keep that paradigm that it is a dangerous sport, but also that other sports are dangerous, sports like baseball. So I'd like to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Yeah. I think